Hi everyone, today we're going to be talking about your second set of sheep breeds, which would bring us up to breed number 61. And we're going to be starting with a very famous breed, which is the Merino of Spain. So you may have heard of Merino wool before. It's a very high quality fine wool that produces soft, lightweight clothing that's not itchy. It's often used to make a lot of high quality hiking garments and things like that. So these guys come in both polled and horned varieties, and when they do have horns, they are long and they spiral away from the head, but the first curve of it tends to grow quite close to the head. To me, these guys always look like the kid who's bundled up in too many layers to go play in the snow. Um, and that's probably because their wool grows year round, so they actually have to be shorn at least once, sometimes twice a year. Otherwise, they can actually become blind because the wool is in the way, and they can have a lot of problems with heat stress and moving around. They do have shorter wool below their knee and hock, so it does still grow, but not nearly as long as the rest of their body. They have a wool cap, but they have that bare face, and they have a pink nose, not a black like some of the other varieties. Um, and these guys also have an excellent flocking instinct, so they're really easy to herd. They respond well to herding dogs and can be managed that way. 53 should hopefully be one of the easiest to recognize, and that is your Navajo churro sheep. This is America's earliest domesticated breed of any species. They were brought into New Mexico's Rio Grande Valley by Spanish explorers in the 16th century, and then raised by Navajo tribes after that. They almost went extinct twice. In the 1860s, the Navajo tribe were declared enemies of the U.S. government, and were driven out of their homes, and at that point their crops and livestock were destroyed, so we lost a lot of these sheep in that period. And then in 1930s there was a government-mandated culling of herds in response to the drought and overgrazing that was going on with the Great Dust Bowl um, and as part of the Great Depression, so we lost them further there. So in the 1970s there were only 450 Navajo churro sheep left in the U.S., and it's still a rare breed today, although those numbers have rebounded a little bit. Males are horned, and one of the really fun things about Navajo churros is they can have anywhere between two and four horns. So they kind of look like mutant sheep, but that is just a normal genetic trait for them. They also have this big, thick double coat. They have long protective hairs on top, and then they have a soft downy undercoat underneath, and that allows them to adapt to different climates. They're also really disease resistant sheep, as you can think about in the southwest, it's pretty dry, um, so they're hardy, they can live in those environments, and it, they have a better tasting meat with a low fat content, so definitely a multi-purpose sheep. 54 is the Oxford, and these are also called the Oxford Down. They originated in Oxfordshire County in England, and they were bred from the Cotswold and Hampshire sheep in the mid-1800s. Because of that, they can be really difficult to tell apart from Hampshire's. Um, they're ideal for pasture grazing, and they can get by on lower quality vegetation than most sheep can. And they are one of the largest breeds. Only Lincolns are larger. So if you did see an Oxford and a Hampshire side by side, these guys would definitely be much bigger than the Hampshires. They are usually black face, but they can have more of a brown or a gray face instead. Um, and to tell them apart from the Hampshires, one of the things is that their wool cap doesn't extend down past the eyes as much in front. So they have a larger snout area that's bare. Um, and then in addition to that, it still does surround the eye um, and it still does come down the cheek, the cheek like the Hampshires does. However, another way that you can tell is they tend to have a lot more wool below the knee and below the hock. Whereas if we look back at our Hampshire sheep from last week, they have some, but it's fairly bare down there in comparison. And you see how their snout is not quite as covered. Oxfords are dual purpose sheep. They're known for producing heavy fleeces. They have a durable medium wool, and they're also really fast growing market lambs. They are probably the most important terminal sire breed in the sheep industry that are known for having the greatest profitability. The fifth, number 55 is a Rambouillet, and you can probably tell from the way the name is pronounced that this is a French sheep. So this is a cross between Merino sheep and the French breeds, um, and because of that, sometimes they are actually called French Merinos. 
They were imported by King Louis the 16th in the late 1700s, but then they were bred more and further developed in Germany in the 1800s. The rams and the ewes can both be horned, but the male horns tend to be much larger than the female horns. And the horn shape is different from the merino. It has much sharper edges. If you can kind of see here, there's a, a very pointed edge to this horn. And that's one of the ways that you can tell them apart from merinos. And they are also dual purpose sheep. They're really good to raise for mutton and they have a fine wool that is identical to merino wool because they actually share all the same genes for their wool. They are more adaptable to different climates than merinos are. Um, and they can live in really rugged environments. They have a really strong flocking instinct like the Merinos and their large body. And these guys are really known as the backbone of the American sheep industry. They're raised across the country and they're crossbred to strengthen other breeds. So Merino sheep that we looked at before, these guys are kind of like champagne. Just like champagne can only be called that if it's grown in a certain region of the world, Merino sheep have to come from this area of Spain, and if they don't, then they're not really allowed to be called Merinos. So these guys are really the American version of Merino sheep, very similar in most ways, but it is the Ramboulet instead when they are raised here. And because they were bred in different countries, they are going to have some of those different traits, like the more sharp edged horns compared to the Merino. Number 56 is the Romney, and these guys were bred in a marshy area of Kent, England that was known for its high winds, heavy rainfall, and lush vegetation. So they do really well in wet weather, and because of that, they're now the major breed that's found in New Zealand, which has similar weather to that area, as well as the Pacific Northwest, especially Oregon, where it's raining all the time. These guys are dual purpose. They're known for having really good feed efficiency, high quality heavy carcasses that are often rated as either prime or choice. They have lean meat that's known for its mild flavor even in the adults, so even mutton would taste closer to lamb. They have a really unique fleece. It's lustrous and it hangs in separate locks, so you can kind of see the crimp of each one. There's minimal cross fibers between the locks, so it's not getting all tangled together, and that makes it really easy to spin. It also has a uniform crimp and low grease content, which means that you're gonna get a higher yield out of it. So Romney wool is in really high demand from fiber artists because it is so easy to work with. It's also really profitable to raise these sheep. Um, they come in mul multiple colors. The white obviously is the most sought after along with tan, gray, and brown. They do have a bare face, but their cheeks are covered in wool and they do have that wool cap. Um, they do have wool all the way down to their fetlock, especially on the hind legs, although it may be a little bit more bare below the knee in the front. Number 57 is another black-faced sheep. So this is the Shropshire, and it was bred in England in the mid-1800s. It's again going to be a little confusing to tell this apart from the Hampshire and the Oxford, but these guys have no wool under their knee at all. They sometimes have some on their hock, but not much. So that is one way that they are different from both the Oxford and the Hampshire um, that would both have wool up here. And they also do not have wool completely surrounding their eye. They will have a little gap of bare skin there. So that's going to be a key thing to tell them apart from the other black faced breeds. They also have much smaller ears than other black faced breeds. And they're known to have small enough ears that they can fit in your cupped hands. Um, this was the most popular and influential breed in the U.S. in the 1920s and 30s, and it was actually larger then, and since then it's been bred for a shorter, more compact size. It's known for having really sound conformation, good carcass quality, and fast growth to market weight. So it is a meat sheep primarily. However, it's triple purpose. Um, its milk is really good for cheese, and a lot of times it's used to graze on Christmas tree farms and keep the grass down. They're known for having a really gentle disposition, which makes them a good choice for 4-H projects. And they are the heaviest wool producer of the medium wool breeds. They have a nice, dense, elastic wool that's popular with the Japanese for filling futons. Number 58 is the South Down. And these guys are sometimes called teddy bear sheep because of their cute little teddy bear faces. 
They come from Sussex, England, and were bred in the 1600s, and are a medium to small size breed. So they're almost like a little toy breed. They're historically very important because they're in the bloodlines of both the Hampshire, the Shropshire, the Suffolk, and the Oxford. All those black-faced sheep actually come from this breed. Um, and they are known for having a head-to-toe medium wool that covers absolutely every part of their body, and that's part of why they have these teddy bear-looking faces. They have gray to brown faces and lower legs, and the rest of the body is more white color. And they are dual purpose, but they're known for their meat qualities. They're early to mature. They're really efficient foragers that have high quality carcasses. And they are considered the premier meat breed um, up until trends actually started to shift towards larger breeds. So these would be easier to raise on a small farm than a lot of those larger breeds. 59 is the Suffolk, which is the last of your black faced sheep. And these guys were bred in England in the 1800s. They are the most popular breed in the U.S., making up more than 50% of all registered sheep. So although they are a black-faced breed, they should be the easiest ones to tell apart because they have these longer floppier ears and they have no wool at all on their head or below their knee or their hock. So it's a little bit easier to pick them out because they're a little bit more bare. They are a meat breed, but technically dual purpose. They're known for having an excellent flavor and texture to the meat, and they grow faster than any other breed, yielding heavy, high cutability carcasses with exactly the characteristics that are in demand from consumers. So these can be a very popular breed to raise. Number 60 is the Texel, and these come from the Isle of Texel that's off the coast of the Netherlands, and they were bred in the 1800s, but not introduced into the US until the 1980s. They have bald legs and these short boxy bodies. And to me, these guys always remind me of like pit bulls from the way they stand, um, very muscly. And they are white faced, but they have a tan wool around the rest of their body. It does not cover their face. It does not cover their legs. They also come in this blue variety um, and they all have these short wide faces with black noses. Um, these are a medium wool breed and they're known for having that remarkable muscle development, and they also have very lean meat and large hindquarters. So this is actually the highest quality carcass of any sheep breed in the world, um, and they're also highly adaptable, so an easy to raise meat breed. The last breed we're gonna look at is the Tunis, and these come from Tunisia in Northern Africa, and they were actually gifted to George Washington in 1799, and that's how they made it into the US. They have these copper red faces with floppy ears and an ivory colored wool on the rest of their body. They also have uniquely light colored eyes. The lambs are actually born in this chocolate brown color and then as they mature, they take on the color of the adults. They also have that broad tail that we saw in the caracal um, for that extra fat storage so they can live in more extreme environments for that and they're well adapted to high heat and humidity. They are a medium wool sheep, although they're ra usually raised for meat. And they're known for their tender, flavorful, mild tasting meat um, with an excellent meat to bone ratio. They're great grazers and they're disease resistant. They are really high uh, efficient efficiency in terms of feed. They have easy births. They're excellent mothers. They ha are heavy milkers. They have a sweet temperament and an extended breeding season. So these are fairly easy to raise, um, and they were very popular in the U.S. until the Civil War, when they nearly became extinct because of the military's meat demand. Um, since then, they have now rebounded, and now they're increasingly in demand, and it's one of the favorite breeds for sustainable small-scale farmers because they are so well-rounded. So one of the things that I would do in looking back at your sheep breeds this week is try to make sure you know the defining characteristics probably especially of the black-faced breeds. Remember the Suffolk has none of that fur on the head at all. The Shropshire has that opening between the eye and the cheek that is free. Um, the Oxford tends to have more of that wool below the knee and hock and then completely covered on their face there. And then your Hampshire is the one that has is very similar to the Oxford, but somewhat less wool on that leg area. For the all-white sheep, remember the Cheviots have the upright ears. Columbia never have horns and have wool all the way down their legs. Dorsets never have wool below the knee in the front. 
And remember, Romneys come in all different colors. That wraps up your sheep breeds, and I hope to see you next week for goats.